Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome to the Createx stage at COGX 2021, co-created with the Creative Industries Council. Do follow the conversation and contribute to it at hashtag Createch UK. So this morning, for those of you who joined us this morning, um, and actually for those of you who didn't, uh, the main message was massive growth in Createch in the UK. Um, investments up by 22%. Awesome. And that's just the beginning. That's domestic investment that that figure comes from. Um, you can read more about that in the Tech Nation report that's just uh, been launched today. And um, also importantly, particularly at this time in sort of post COVID, nearly post COVID era, 50% growth in Createch roles. What a wonderful time for an amazing new tool stroke technology to enter our lives in the form of 5G and to tell us more about the amazing transformative powers that this will um, have for our sector. I'd like to introduce our next session um, and our moderator, Emily Savage, who is the Commercial Product Lead Immersive at Digital Catapult. Emily, welcome. Thank you so much, Christine. Brilliant. Well, um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here joining you on the Cretech stage at COGX 2021, or more realistically, from a very hot uh, house in East London, but um, really delighted. I am going to be joined today by a group of creative leaders that represent um, the whole stretch of creative industries. And we're going to be discussing exactly, uh, as was just introduced there, the potential of 5G and what it actually means for the creative industries, for the types of activities and services that we all run, and for most importantly, the new types of audience experiences that are gonna be unleashed through this new network power. So I will, in a minute, uh, properly allow our, our three panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, they are Sam Field, who is Director of Creative, creative Tech at Verizon's Riot Studio. We have Jamie Gosney, who is creative director at, at Sonosphere, and we have Debbie Bandara, who is founder and CEO of Forest Tribe. So welcome all. I will hand over in one second to you. First of all, I will say a few more words about myself. Um, so I am, uh, as introduced, I am the uh, immersive commercial lead at Digital Catapult. For, for those of you that don't know, Digital Catapult is the advanced digital technology innovation organization for the UK. Um, in, in slightly more uh, layman's terms, that means that we run a whole host of research and development projects um, within the sphere of XR, so that's all things immersive, 5G, Internet of Things, and uh, artificial intelligence. And we do that both for the creative sector and for the manufacturing sectors as well. But that's enough uh, about my side. Um, I am now going to hand over. Let's start off with um, Sam. Please tell us a little bit more about your job and what you get up to with Riot. Hi, right, thank you. Good to be here, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I run a, a team of creative technologists for Riot Studio. Uh, we're based in uh, Verizon Media. We work um, really closely with our brands and advertisers to really help them embrace emerging technologies and that could be anything from ar and vr emerging connectivity like 5g or it could just be about you know understanding what the meta what role the metaverse will play in there and how their brands can take advantage so um lots of it is around virtual production the the, the growth of game engine technology and so on so for us you know 5g represents a really exciting opportunity to evolve what's already being delivered in terms of brand experiences, ad experiences, and immersive storytelling. All right, thank you, Sam. Okay, go on over to Debbie. Tell us a little bit more about um, your company and what you've developed. So um, we are a, an immersive theatre company and we really deliver theatrical experiences to both mainstream and neurodiverse audiences. And we really deploy 5G, the use of haptics, um, spatial sound, um, mix reality into the, into our work and make it embedded so that we can deliver it into different new audiences across regionally as well as locally in the area. And we really are focusing on more of an immersive storytelling approach, adopting techniques from artificial intelligence as well. 
Brilliant. Thanks, Debbie. We're going to hear lots more from Debbie about some of the um, incredible projects that they have been running this year and testing out 5G um, around as well. And now go on, Jamie, let's hear a little bit more about your company and what you get up to, please. Hi. Uh, yes, I'm Jamie Gosney. Thank you for having me as well. Um, I'm the uh, commercial stroke creative director of a company called Sonosphere who are all about immersive audio. Uh, my background is from live sound. Um, I started in the mid 70s um, with analog equipment and I ended up um, touring with a bunch of bands and then I came back and was very involved in um, live theatre and mixing the front of house and stuff. But uh, in around 2000, I was working at the Millennium Dome um, as head of sound for imagination and I started to experiment with immersive audio and um, very recently, a couple of years ago, uh, a great friend of mine, Tim Sherratt, who'd started Sonosphere, asked me to become part of the company. And Sonosphere is, um, yeah, it's everything to do with immersive audio, whether that's content creation um, or live sound um, um, or, or, uh, or audio for video. So and anything where we can we can put a, a, um, a an immersive audio stamp on it will we'll be there. And we were fortunate to be asked to be part of the uh, the 5G festival project, which is sort of consuming me at the moment. So that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Brilliant. Yeah. And again, we are going to talk a whole host more about the 5G Festival project. So uh, as you can all see, we've got a really wonderful, diverse representation here of the creative industries, ranging right away from the kind of advertising and brand side of, of the story through to theatre and education. And then, of course, also music and live events. So um, really, over the next um, 25 minutes or so, we're going to uh, have a, a, a bit more of an in-depth chat as to some of the R&D that's been going on in and around 5G and what uh, our three panellists are actually seeing as the advantages. I think we've all probably had um, our absolute kind of up to up to the eyeballs in terms of what 5G is supposed to do, but is only actually starting to be the case that we are now properly testing it. We're now actually seeing the results through the test beds, through the private networks that are being developed. So it is a really exciting time. And I think we're um, a, a lot further on than where we were a year ago um, in terms of knowing what we can get out of these new network requirements. So um, let's start off, uh, Sam, let's talk a little bit more about what Riot have been up to, because obviously Riot has got a uh, scope both here in the UK, but also in the US. And as we know, Verizon in the US are doing uh, you know, they are very much uh, a million miles an hour in terms of the 5G rollout. So there's an awful lot that's um, already in place that maybe isn't yet quite in place here in the UK. So you guys have got that kind of future vision into what's possible um, and, and what brands are really um, picking up their appetite towards. So tell us more about some of the projects that, that, you're, that you've been involved with and that you're seeing um, throughout Riot, please. Yeah, I think I think it's, it, the, the interesting part thing about being part of, of a company like Verizon is you, you do get these kind of early access views on, on what's coming because you know the infrastructure we're seeing going in, in in the US at the moment is is quite far advanced of what we have here in the UK. That's not to say that you know what we can't do amazing things here in the UK, but they they are ahead of us in that sense. Um, and I think some of the interesting projects, I think we we can what you see from the telcos often is they they try and deliver proof of concept specifically to tell the stories of different elements. So our CEO calls it the eight, eight currencies, so speed and throughput, latency and so on, so density of networks. Um, and I think what will be exciting is when more and more brands start to test it themselves, delivering what they want to deliver, so their own stories, not delivering the stories of the telco, but actually using that infrastructure to tell their own stories in more immersive and engaging ways. Um, but I think on, on, on a really base level, what's exciting is you start to see the the, the the potential of some of pre-existing technologies, pre-existing social channels. You take, mm. for example, the Riot team worked with um, the Black Pumas in the US um, and created a landmark lens on Snapchat where they delivered an entire uh, virtual song. So you could place the Black Pumas head front, front man in front of the New York Public Library and get a full 50 megabyte experience, so a, li a live concert experience. Whereas if you were not a 5G customer, you could still access experience, but you got five seconds of that mm. concert rather than a full three and a half minute live performance or, or, or pre-rendered performance using motion capture. So you can already start to tangibly see the difference between having a 5G phone and a 5G device and a 5G network and not having it because that experience is enhanced. 
that's not to say that that is the end of what we can do. Um, you know, other projects include working with the NFL using private networks in NFL stadiums to deliver live augmented reality statistics on pitch, so overlaying on the pitch, using computer vision to recognize the location of the pitch, location of the players, and pulling in real-time statistics from that NFL game, overlaid on that pitch in real time, um, as well as sort of multi-camera views and so on. So we're starting to see, you know, that's thinking about the density of a, of a stadium. You're talking potentially 100,000 people, which at the moment, you know, 4G starts to, to fall over at that point. So having that, that amount of data um, consumed by that that size of an audience is, is key. Um, I think you're also seeing yeah, other, other projects like you saw uh, Balenciaga use things like volumetric capture in their recent mm -hmm. video game they created, and they used you know they, they cloud rendered that and streamed that to devices for an hour availability, um, and you know there were mixed responses to that, but the ambition was there to use the existing infrastructure to deliver it. Now that would have been greatly enhanced by a robust five G network because. Yeah. You know, you'd be able to stream that, and you know, and had a more immersive experience. So, for us, it's about the speed of change. It's about how immersive can you get the high fidelity, immersive audio, all of these things that exist already. It's not about recreating something new. It's about enhancing that what already exists. Absolutely, I think you've raised some really, really good points there because ultimately with 5G, it is you know like any network step change. It is a step change, but in in this particular case it's really significant because of the fact that we're suddenly going to be able to really have use cases in high density situations number one I think that's a really important one with the creative industries to start spelling out is that this is the network that does enable a live um, stadium or a theater or a music venue to actually have guaranteed um, not only guaranteed kind of network availability but also available for different usages that you can um you know pre uh pre-allocate and guarantee and then i think the the other point that you you mentioned as well is around the streaming and this again is where we've, we've been streaming things for a long time but so far we've been pretty tied to locations and locations that have been uh, very dominated by a fixed line access and now we can start looking at what does that mean if we're able to stream heavy content anywhere at any time and what does the industry implications uh, what do they look like but going on that note i think um debbie because so debbie you've come at this almost from the extreme opposite because you are a a, a kind of far smaller theater company in, in in terms you know if we're to compare you to uh, verizon company size i'm not saying you're small i'm just saying that yeah you are a a local company um with a very um dedicated services to what you're already providing um as you say the the education services that you provide so um starting to test on 5g was was a really adventurous move for you guys as a, as a company um and you know you you it it was the case that you've been um, able to take advantage of some of the programs that have been going on through digital catapult which have been brilliant but you have absolutely surpassed i think what anyone expected in terms of the amount of um effort and um and, and the findings that that you've developed so tell us a bit more about how you've been utilizing the power of of 5g to enhance what you're able to deliver as a company well we as a company prior to covid we were all happily delivering our theatrical shows to audiences that were um, not able to access arts and theatre as easily um, from low socioeconomic backgrounds and in particular children young people with complex learning needs so from that stance we were able to realize that these particular audiences were not actually accessing any arts and culture throughout the pandemic phase and that's where I really thought carefully of how we can really utilize the power of 5g to really reach out to these audiences and also embedding technology that is actually absolutely generally embedded in the experience the immersive experiences not just an add-on experience so we are we realize the the opportunity that 5g can offer and it offered that live theatrical real one-to-one -one connection that is really hard in many many ways with the with the sort of uh, the bandwidth that we usually get access to 
the 5G and higher bandwidth really does offer that real-time connection, which is what we really wanted to embed in our in our use case and our in our project. We also realized that from this particular project that we delivered into special schools in this particular um, instance, we were able to reach the new audiences and new audiences that have never actually accessed any arts and creativity because of their particular conditions that they're, that they're living in. And also it was absolutely accessible to them. So we were offering an inclusive offer, which was amazing, amazing experience to, to generate. Mm. And also another aspect was the fact that we realised from the project that we delivered and from our the theatrical experiences, it's actually it was environmentally sound. So, you know, in terms of reducing the carbon footprint from the traditional touring models that we do have in, in our theatre world, this was offering a different approach. Mm. So in, in many ways, the distribution aspect, the production aspects, and the cons con consuming aspects were all really, really um, highlighting the importance of 5G as a conduit to make this possible for our audiences. That is, that is fascinating because, you know, we, we're really therefore talking about access on two levels, aren't we? Obviously, a network provides access, but the way that, that Forest Tribe have been able to use it is to actually increase audience accessibility which is naturally you know it's a it's a very strong motivation across the whole of the art space the whole of the creative sector have got very very uh, you know high impact targets to to be reaching more people and, and broadening out who gets to enjoy um uh, the theater and, and creative space so um i mean there's so much there's so much more to uh, to talk about with with this and we will we'll come back to you as well debbie um but go on jamie i, I want to be able to uh, make sure we we get to hear some more detail as well at this point of the the 5g festival so here again we've got um a project that the kind of sits maybe somewhere in the middle as, as to what we've heard from uh sam and debbie so far because this is a collaborative research and development project um it's one that is being part funded um by the by the uk government which is very exciting and it's got some really big name partners involved uh, such as o2 such as warner um, and, and then um, yourselves and a whole bunch of um, other audio companies you can tell us more about. But let, let's explore that for now. What, what is the overall premise of the 5G festival? What are you doing that wouldn't have been possible to, to do with, uh, with 4G? Okay, so um, the, the best way to explain the, what we're doing with the 5G festival is to look at the, the three use cases. Um, so the first use case, um, is we we wanted to allow musicians to, to collaborate live over the 5G network um, with insignificant latency. So so it was like they were playing in the same room together. Um, once we'd achieved that, the next use case was to be able to broadcast out a performance or you know people to be able to watch musicians rehearsing to people on their phones and tablets and VR headsets, etc. And then the final use case is a hybrid of the first two, um, but with live audiences. So the use case three is will eventually be three venues, which will be Brighton Dome, um, the Blue Room at the O2 Arena and metropolis studios and there'll be bands and individual musicians in each of those venues and we will uh perform uh, with with also with live audiences in each venues you know whether that's socially distanced i don't know at this point but um so there'll be live audiences in all three venues but the bands and musicians from each of those venues will be playing um remotely with other musicians and bands from the other venues and um we just come back off the, off the second trials. We did um, we did the first trials, sort of mocking up the network in March this year, where we where we the, the whole plan was to we got three musicians in Brighton Dome, but we split them up into different rooms, and we had them over a, a sort of j just a, a cable network. But the idea was we were trying to find out the latency tolerances that that musicians could play with, and that was it was so interesting because um, it first of all we 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 had all the musicians in the same room and they were just playing acoustically with each other they were able to see each other and obviously that worked really well we then we then put them on um in-ear monitors so they were hearing each other electronically now um and you know they could still see each other and then they 
they played together fine. And this is all over the network, um, by the way. Then we introduced immersive um, audio into their ears through uh, a system called the Clang system, which is um, uh, which is a, a, a musician's monitoring, an immersive musician's monitoring system. And then and then we took away their sight. And it was really interesting at that point. The the they were sort of in the middle of playing a song, and we took away their ability to see each other by putting pipe and drape up around the room. And suddenly the vibe of that song changed completely. I, I mean, for the better, actually. They they suddenly sort of gone off into their own little world, uh, weren't intimidated by other people watching them or being watched by other musicians, and were able to really, really connect with the music at that point. But then we split all the three musicians up and started to add latency to the network. And we started, we did it in five millisecond um, um, degrees. So we started off at five milliseconds. We then went up to 10 to 15. We actually got it up to 40 milliseconds before it, the whole thing fell apart. And then I said to the guys, right, let's take it back to 25 milliseconds. As soon as we did that, they went, oh, yeah, this is fine. We can we can cope with this. They, they And by the way, the musicians didn't know what we were doing. They didn't know we were adding latency. They could hear slight changes. Um, but actually, at 25 milliseconds, they were able to play um, in time with each other. And uh, and um, but then. Last week, we um, we took this a stage further. So we had six musicians this time. We had two musicians in Metropolis Studios. So we had a drummer and a vocalist in, in Metropolis. We then had a guitarist and a keyboard player on stage in the concert hall at Brighton Dome. And then we had a bass player and another singer in another room in Brighton Dome. Now this is all over, um, and this was all done over a, a, um, a leased line for the moment, but we were simulating the, the 5G network. And we had issues with the network to begin with, but you know that's what these trials were all about. And then on Thursday, the 10th last week, and I'd gone down to Brighton, I'd been in Petropolis in the morning and I, I drove down to Brighton and suddenly the network all came in, to life and I was watching on the screen because there was video involved in this as well. Yeah. Six musicians in different locations playing together absolutely in time. And it was one of those moments. And I, to be honest, it was like hair on the back of your neck. And, and I got really teary because I thought this is something we've talked about for so long. I mean, I've, I've been wanting to do this for four or five years. And suddenly it became a reality. And, you know, and that the, the potential. Um, it is enormous um, for musicians across the world being to collaborate live and or, or musicians from different countries and different cultures being able to meet online and play together. And, you know, the, what could emerge from that is, you, you know, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, I know. Right. That is, that is truly special. And that that is, um, you know, where we're where we do start to see some of the real positive, you know, 5G's had a hard time, I think we can all say PR wise, but as we actually start to push through to the results of some of these trials, that's where we can all start properly believing in it, I think, because you're right. I mean, not only because of COVID, but because of sustainability as well, we, we do have to work out ways of being able to integrate with each other and being able to lean into each other's, uh, as you say, uh, countries and, and the many people working within those countries and to do that from a production, music production point of view, um, will be game changing. We'll, we'll definitely feel yeah. like a, a new era of, of what's going on at the moment. Sure. I mean, I, I, so it's so exciting to hear about Jamie. And we know we're, we're still only kind of halfway through um, the whole project. There's, there's more stages to happen um, that I, I believe will also involve uh, using augmented reality glasses as well. To, oh, you know, we, we've done yeah. that already, actually. We, we did have um, AR glasses for these trials. So we had the, the drummer in Metropolis was wearing AR glasses and he just didn't want to take them off. So he was seeing the musicians um, that we were using depth cameras to, to do cutouts of the musicians in Brighton, which he could see in his AR glasses. And of course he could see the rest of the room as well, but he actually looked pretty cool with them on because they're dark glasses and um, it, it was, yeah, but he was loving it. And then we had a, um, another pair or another couple of pairs in Brighton in each of the, each of the spaces. So yeah, I think the, that we were talking to the musicians about it and the keyboard player and the guitarist because by the very nature of what they do they have to look down at their keyboard or the guitar so so they didn't get on so well with them but um, right, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. These are the, as you say, the nuances that are still to kind of be unraveled, I guess, as, sure. as we keep testing. Yeah. I mean, Sam, when you when you hear things like that, obviously um, you with Rise as well, you're also involved in, in this 5G festival and, and supporting it. But you talk all the time to, to brands and to brands that are, uh, you know, again, trying to work out what the loop forward is to to attract new consumer eyes and to, to, to build the, the, the next best advertising campaign. What? What sort of, um, I guess, advice and rhetoric are you um, starting to, to talk to brands about when when looking at some of these advanced technologies like like 5G and, and what's possible? I think, I think the main advice <clears throat> is don't don't wait don't wait for it to be mainstream and ubiquitous because by then it's too late. You know, your competitors will be doing it. And I think, you know, we, we funnily enough, last year we, we did a big piece of consumer research across Europe. Um, asking audiences about their attitudes towards immersive or towards AR, VR, and in particular how it'd be enhanced by 5G. And it, we kind of asked them at the, the worst time to go and take a kind of um, a, a test of an audience because we did it in March last year, literally two weeks before we went into lockdown. But actually, it gave us an opportunity to go back and ask the same people or the same cross section of society in September and see how those attitudes had changed. And, and it was phenomenal to see the change in, in attitude. We saw, so now two thirds of all adults expect their interactions with brands online to be seamless, innovative, and to enhance their real world. So you think about what that means for AR wearables, think about what that means for sort of private networks, density of live events, and so on, and overlaying it with kind of a digital layer. This is exactly what people now want. And that goes up to 84% for 18 to 24 year olds. Um, we've also found that people excited by 5G enabled AR and VR experiences jumped from 50% to 69%. And we saw a really, really similar amount. So uh, the over 55s, for example, went from 38% to 69%. So we're seeing huge, huge change, not just you know, younger audiences, Gen Z, millennials. This is, this is across the board. People are embracing it. And it's kind of, we talked for a long time about, you know, 5G is the enabler of existing technologies. Yes, there'll be new technologies that come along because of it. But this is about enhancing what we already have. And I think, you know, the, the pan, you know, we were saying you know, these these trends would happen over two, three years. But what happened with the pandemic is that was just accelerated into the first half of last year. And suddenly, for the first time in a long time, kind of consumer appetite overtook what was technically possible. So now you've got lots and lots of businesses who are coming to market, creating and testing and, 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 and so on. So. You know, we're running a, a 5G retail accelerator with three huge brands. Um, mm -hmm. um, so the likes of, uh, I don't know, am I allowed to say? Uh, <laughs> really good point. I know we're, 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 yeah. so we're running a, a 5G so, yeah. accelerator to, together um, as Digital Catapult and Riot Verizon. And we will be announcing, I think, in about the next week. So we should probably. Yeah, next week. But they're so we're, we're there now, but a, a, really, a really big British retailer, huge um, drinks conglomerates um and and also beauty brands so you've, you've got a real mix of brands and they're really leaning into it you know they, they want to test and learn and i think that's the key if you can you know, ring, ring fencing some budget to test this even if it's not testing on a 5g network but testing technologies and experiences that will be enhanced by 5g i think is a really really smart approach um it's, it's great to see the number of of businesses, you know, Debbie's Debbie mentioned it, you know, herself before about who perhaps weren't leaning into space before and now really are. And they're the ones, you know, when the creative industries get involved, that's when it starts to become more tangible and more exciting to pursue consumers because it's not, you know, no offense to developers, it's not just developers working with the technology for you know through their through their eyes, it's the creative. So, you know, we, we work with immersive theater companies in, in in sort of immersive escape rooms that are led by good technology and so on. So yeah, for me, that's that 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 would be my advice: is to is, is to get involved and test and learn. One hundred percent agree. Two two well, several really good bits of advice there in terms of yeah, definitely start to think about that R and D budget as companies is so so important. Um, but then equally, yeah, as creative brains, and hopefully we've got a whole load in the audience here. And and by the way, do feel free to um to get questions in into us. I think we've got ten minutes left. Um. But yeah, the creative brains layered on top of the technologists and what it really takes to, to start painting the picture. And go on, Debbie, on, on that note, because I think, you know, you're representing a part of the creative sector here, um, which as, as potentially as, as theatre companies, they're not always um, well known for, for having 
deep technologists embedded into them. So what would your advice be to, I guess, other um, uh, creative and freelance and theater and education um, companies like yourselves that, that are thinking, yeah, you know what, I could see a valid use case. How how have you gone about kind of playing with the playing with the network, so to speak, and, and what's the advice as to how to build the capability within your within your company? Well, I, I really think that over the next ten years, and we've got to be really realistic here. You know, digital technology and five G and six G, it's all going to come into a big a big play, and we have to really utilize the and deploy it into our work. So I do feel that as a theatre company, we have to be have an awareness since the pandemic that most of our audiences are not always going to be wanting to go to, back to the theater in the usual state it will take a while for them to develop that confidence to go back and from this experience we've also realized there's a hybrid form mm. of theater that's been created and i think we need to really um you know really utilize and take take stock of what's happened and 5G and what it can offer is 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 just immense, really truly immense. By really reaching out to completely new different audiences that's never really had access to arts and creativity, I think we need to really think about how it's important for a technical team to be set up in a in a theatrical space. And I think that's going to be the in-house team is going to play a huge part, not just for the theatre but for employment in the sector as well. So sector growth is going to be really important here. So we need to really think about how we're going to train and support new uh, technical team, technical staff that can be equipped with the skills so that they can then be able to, to, to transfer their skills into these different settings, whether it's in music, whether it's in brand and, and publicity, whether it's in theatre. But I do think now is a time to start rethinking about this organisational structure of companies in general in, in the sector especially in theater set in in theater organizations yeah i 100 percent agree i mean there's there's a, a real kind of skills now i think national challenge that we have which you know in some to some extent i think we can have a lot of confidence in the fact that we have got a lot of the skills they're just not necessarily um involved in the right sectors at the moment and there is going to be a huge requirement for developers data scientists to get more involved in um, a whole swathe of the creative industries, um, not least, as you say, theatre, music, TV and film as well, are, are all going through through big shifts. So, I mean, yeah, on that particular tune, I think, um, Jamie, when you and I were speaking previously, you said, you said a brilliant sentence that was, that was something like this, I'm paraphr paraphrasing slightly, but you said, 5G represents the same disruption as when punk entered the music scene back in the uh, back in the seventies. So um, tell us tell us more about the kind of shift that you think we're actually seeing in the music industry as a whole at the moment. I'm, I'm sure it's not entirely five G uh, related, but what does that mean again for skills and for uh, what's needed uh, within the industry? Uh, well, I mean, the reason I sort of likened it to the whole punk scene was because punk kind of gave you know anybody the opportunity to sort of start their own band if you could play three chords or hit a drum kit and you didn't even have to sing that well but it it kind of opened up a whole new um way of of playing music and it gave people you know people in their garages in their bedrooms and stuff a, an outlet and you know and we got some amazing bands that came out of that life you know world changing bands and i think with this new technology it's you know what i'm starting to see or, or what i'm hearing from people is it's going to give artists a kind of direct communication with their fans so for example i'm one of the other companies i'm working with a company called live revolution which is my partner sarah and i started we're looking at different business models um um in as much as that you know okay so you can buy a car online now you can buy a car directly from a manufacturer you you know apple took that thing where they made computer hardware and software but they didn't have a retail outlet so now you can buy directly from um from apple through through the apple shop and i think what we're doing with live revolution and, and i and i think with 5gf as well will come out of 5gf is that that artists will see that they can communicate directly with their fans um so with, with live revolution what we're trying to do is cut out um the middleman if you like and 
asking artists to take a risk with us. So we'll we'll put on a, a production, whether that's you know a live production with an audience, and we'll stream it out to people. But we'll ask the artist to take the risk in terms of the production costs. So once the production costs are paid for, the the revenue from ticket sales, online ticket sales or streaming ticket sales, then gets split 50-50 with the artist. And that's you know that's not happened before. And um, you know, just being part of the whole thing last week in Brighton and, and the musicians um, that we were working with and the potential they saw about communicating directly with their fans. It's so that's, you know, that's the way I see this, this working in terms of the kind of punk analogy is that it's, it, it means anybody can, you know, do it. I mean, we, you know, people can do it now with YouTube and, and um, but I think this is just going to make it much, much easier. I mean, I, I think you, you brought up a point here, which it seems to be, um, you know, being being brought up by all of us, which is there is this potential for new business models, which is is yeah. one of the things that 5G is actually unleashing. It's yes, it's, you know, making content move faster and at lower latency, et cetera. But really at the bottom of it, we're seeing various industries and companies kind of shape shift slightly in terms of their their offering. I mean, you're, you're talking there about having a, a slightly more direct offering to the musicians themselves and uh, therefore kind of uh, cutting out maybe some of the, the pain that many artists uh, have felt over the years of, of having multiple middlemen. Um, Debbie, you're, you're equally talking about, um, uh, I think, a whole variety of, of new offerings that, that could be formed through, through your business, right, because of the potential for, for greater connectivity. Um, and, uh, and sorry, I don't know, either Debbie or, or Sam, on that kind of note of new business models, um, have, have either of you started thinking more or seeing more some of the, I guess, um, business variations that are, that are taking form because of this connectivity power? I think, um, do you want to go, Debbie? You, you, you can go for <laughs> I was just following on from Jamie's point there about the kind of live music element. We're seeing so many musicians testing different platforms, you know, from, from um, Fortnite and Roblox to Animal Crossing and, you know, not just in gaming platforms, but thinking about kind of immersive concerts and using game engine technology to deliver kind of live pixel stream experiences. I think within that world, we're now looking at, okay, with the convergence of XR, 5G and blockchain is the beginning of spatial web or what people are terming the metaverse. And for me, that's a really interesting space to play because if I can show up to my to the virtual concert from Live Revolution and be able to choose my Adidas sneakers that I wear on my virtual avatar, I can take them into different platforms and you know wear my band on that in Roblox. That's that in its in essence is the beginning of that kind of metaverse conversation with these uniform file sizes that actually and the the how immersive that experience can be powered by better connectivity is the thing that makes people come back and want to take them into different areas so i think this kind of nft blockchain trend you know while it's hyped right now i think we'll, we'll start to infiltrate new business models as a as underpinning you know how we interact culturally with you know culturally through music through art through creativity and how we then take those assets and use them in different platforms um, yeah. using strong connectivity Absolutely. Yes. The birth of the metaverse feels like it might actually be a, be reality now rather than uh, just a, a novelty concept. But go on, Debbie, I think we've got a couple of minutes left. I, I know that you mentioned to me about how your, your business is kind of already starting to adapt because of, of new ways you could see yourselves virtually offering things almost. Absolutely. With the 5G, with the rural kind of reach, we can see how we can really try and deliver our work further afield, reaching to new audiences. And that's really affected our way of thinking of the private 5G network, where we can possibly buy into the network for a touring, tour, a touring set of dates for our shows. And also with the whole business strategy of knowing that certain communities may not have the funding to support the payment of the shows. We're offering this um, opportunity where we can then create our high-end immersive experiences to our other customers, our mainstream customers, to them know that they can buy in to something that will allow them to pay for a, a, a school or a special school to have access to a really nice immersive theatre experiences. So that symbiotic relationship yeah 
it's really important and i think that's another way that 5g can if we harness it well and it's embedded well we can really make use of it so it is more of a democracy of how it's been distributed yeah, yeah, totally agree. Yeah, to actually power the circular economy uh, is very exciting. Well, I think on that note, we are out of time. So thank you so much, Debbie, Sam, Jamie. Thank you very much for, for joining me for this session. Um, thank you, Createc and Creative Industries Council as well for inviting us in the first place. And uh, it's been a pleasure to be, to be here at COGEX 2021. And we look forward to being back um, in, in real presence next year, hopefully. Thank you ever so much and goodbye. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for a really interesting session. Well, I never thought of 5G being as, as disruptive as punk. Wonderful. Um, and life in the metaverse to come. I'm really looking forward to that. And while all us wonderful Createc practitioners get our heads around 5G, you'll be pleased to know that there are some brain boxes out there at the University of Surrey who've just announced their 6G research programme. So more and more to come. Um, and more to come from Createc too. We'll see you back here at one o'clock. Please do join us. See you later. <laughs>